Uh, for our next presenter, we have uh, Andrea Di Mira with um, validation of ESA's IZN1 station and overview of current station capabilities. Good morning, everyone. So this is a high-level overview of the Itzania station, the ISA uh, SLR station, and I will be providing some initial validation results of, um, of, of, of the station and some capabilities. This talk is um, uh, on behalf of uh, the European Space Operations Center, um, the optical technology section, uh, the space debris office, and the ISA navigation office, and the GOS. Let's start with some uh, general information about the station. So the station is located in Tenerife at an altitude um, of 2,400 meters above sea level. And it's based on um, commercial components and it's remotely operated. So the station, according to um, a convention we have at ISOC, is named after Itzania, which is a mountain ridge which already hosts a number of um, telescopes. And you can see also the um, um, other ESA asset, the optical ground station. So those telescopes are operated since the 60s by the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias. And you can imagine that uh, laser operations must be coordinated. That's why we operate multiple wavelengths, in particular infrared is, a, is our baseline. And also we have a uh, laser traffic control system which um, allows us to deconflict and prioritize between observations. Right. Um, those are the objectives for our station. In particular, we would like to um, provide stable SLR data at both wavelengths, in particular 1064 nanometers for the reason I just mentioned, and support the ILRS as uh, an engineering station. Um, and provide on-demand SLR support to missions and also to in case of contingency cases. Uh, we are pushing the technology for space debris uh, observations, active and passive, and, and also um, optical communications, in particular Leo direct to Earth. Um, Itzania 1 is, is a prototype, is a testbed station available for industry for testing new technologies. And we set ourselves the goal to be autonomous into uh, operations because it's remotely operated to be successful in all this, um, let's say, ambitious goals. Um, a bit of history, the station kickoff, uh, the project kickoff was in 2018 and a couple of years were dedicated to the design and integration and of course, uh, impact from COVID. Um, and um, yes, and since June last year, we, we have deployed the station in Tenerife and we provide SLR uh, support. Um, we installed recently in June this year uh, a new package for optical communications, which I will quickly introduce later. And since um, next, as of next year, we're preparing for uh, the upgrades for space debris laser ranging. Um, just a quick overview on, on the major subsystems of the station. So we have an um, 80 centimeter uh, telescope um, with, which features uh, four NASMIS foci, which gives us this, the flexibility to install new instruments um, and for prototyping purposes. Um, our SLR source is a new dimum yak laser. Together with um, um, the laser transmit optics is installed as a piggyback on the telescope. And, um, and yeah, it emits at both wavelengths, basically. Infrared is our baseline, um, and it's um, operating at a repetition rate of 400 hertz. Um, not visible in this picture, on the other side of the fork mount, we have a detector package. Of course, uh, we have to support also uh, the two wavelengths in the reception, so we, we have two spans um, integrated. We have also some additional uh, important um, subsystems like space debris camera for passive observations installed on an available NASMIS port and all the other um, vital equipment for SLR 
including range gate generator, event timer, frequency and timing integrated into ARAC in the control room together with the laser safety subsystem. And uh, yeah, we have also an ADSB receiver and in the future infrared thermal cameras for, for aircraft detection. Um, how do we calibrate system delays? We have in principle two possibilities. We have a short distance target, which is providing basically, it's quite a good option, but we rely mostly on fiber calibration. So basically a portion of the beam is leaked into fiber and installed on the telescope spider. Um, and we calibrate the system delays quite in a flexible way, I would say. It's our baseline calibration mode, independent mostly from telescope position. Um, we are planning few upgrades, um, um, in particular to include also um, a space debris uh, dome and the laser, and also a monument for, the, uh, for a local tire realization. More details on this will be shared by Andres talk um, on session seven. Right, um, as a side development, we have uh, integrated into the station some additional components, uh, which allow to convert the station into an optical ground station for optical communications. So we have included a, a beacon system, um, an optical receiver, a modem, and an acquisition and tracking system, which goes um, on the other side of the telescope fork on the available um, uh, NASMIS. This system allows us to basically transmit via the NASMIS port um, a beacon, uh, so a large divergence laser beam at 50, 90 nanometers according to the CCSDS standard on optical and off keying. And, um, and, and in this way, we can point to spacecraft um, or CubeSat uh, with a laser terminal on board to support acquisition and tracking. Um, and yes, uh, we have tested the system um, last June um, in a campaign with the flying laptop, the satellite you see here from University of Stuttgart, which is hosting um, a laser terminal, OSIRIS version one from DLR. We managed to prove uh, course and fine pointing, and we managed to couple um, some light into the multi-mode fiber in the receive path um, with quite some good uh, residual RMS tracking error below two micro radians. We will continue testing the station uh, next year for optical communications as soon as we have more opportunities, more launches are planned. Coming back to the SLR topic, um, in this slide, I present just two examples of early LEGOS passes at both wavelengths. Um, green, 10, 64 nanometers. Um, those passes were, we, we tracked LEGOS after, after the um, deployment of the station, despite um, some initial, let's say, coordinates used, which pro produced some quite um, large range biases at the time uh, compared to the uh, prediction. Yeah, we could see that the normal point generation is quite stable. And the, ob the observer had quite some good visibility via scope, the station software, um, about the, um, let's say, the most important um, steps of the processing and filtering algorithms. Right. Um, this is not enough, of course, for gaining some confidence about the performance of the station. Therefore, we were supported by different validation um, entities for gaining more confidence. And in particular, the work from the expert center was great. We could uh, basically, um, the expert center had a look at the normal point data from Itzania 1 uh, for uh, 18 weeks um, between 20, 21 and 22, so some early passes, and using some reference laser orbits with an accuracy below one centimeter, um, we could be basically, the outcome of the validation was quite good already for laser satellites in the order of, of the accuracy of the orbits, I would say, for both wavelengths, the green and the infrared. So this gave us some, um, let's say, confidence about the performance, and a similar approach using um, IGS multi-GNSS satellite orbits uh, was uh, followed for 
uh, validating uh, the performance to higher targets, high, um, like GLONASS and Galileo. So also here, the um, uh, mean residuals are in the order of the accuracy of the uh, validation orbits. Um, and um, of course, this is interesting, um, and it gave us some confidence about the performance, and, mo and more updated analysis of the data and the performance of the station to Galileo was provided by Francisco in his talk yesterday. Um, next. Um, it's not working. Sorry. In parallel, we got some uh, validation results from the ESOC Navigation Office as an um, analysis center for the uh, ILRS. Um, and our colleagues followed the standard procedure for validating um, the, the station uh, products. So um, here you can see that um, um, based on 12 weeks of measurements, at also at the end of, of 2021 and beginning of 2022, uh, their 21-day solution, based on fixed coordinates, provided for Legio's similar um, mean residuals and RMS compared to the um, analysis from the, from the expert center. So this is quite confirming uh, what a different entity um, um, provided. It's an interesting result for us. Um, According to the clean seven-day solution from the ESOC navigation office, based on free coordinates, this accuracy went even down. I mean, the mean, I mean, the mean residuals for, uh, for Legios. Um, at ESOC, they also had a look at the coordinate repeatability based on um, initial a priori um, station coordinates provided by JSET, showing a mean uh, deviation from the a priori coordinates uh, of uh, maximum 18 millimeters in the up coordinate. Right. Um, in parallel, we completed the um, qualification process for the ILRS and um, on April 2024, and we have been operating remotely the station. Um, and you can see here how is the trend for our average uh, later session RMS, uh, which is appro um, approaching or even better than six, six millimeters um, currently. We've been operating the station primarily for Galileo, um, for internal ESA uh, priority, uh, but also to several um, uh, geodetic targets and space debris initial uh, uh, cooperative uh, um, uh, laser ranging, sorry. More details about the statistics will be presented by Sven's talk uh, after this talk. Therefore, I would like just to complete uh, my overview showing some additional showcases, let's say, um, for um, apart from optical communications at SLR. So we tried, despite the low energy of our laser system, we, we tried to track some uh, cooperative um, uh, targets like Topex and um, Rocket Buddies. And yes, we managed to get some returns and the features you see in the residuals um, could be exploited for attitude uh, characterization. Um, uh, Andrea, so, we have about one minute. Yeah, left. similar to this, also some passive space debris observations um, in different uh, orbits, and this capability was um, validated by the expert center again. And uh, yes, and you see some light curves and extrapolation of attitude characteristics. Right. Let me just summarize saying that we have a new station in Tenerife um, as of 2021, operational for SLR, optical communications and debris observations. And um, the station is an engineering station. We are uh, honored to be part of the, in, uh, the ILRS. And some validation entities have proven that its annual one has reached a quite good performance. And we're continuing the uh, developments towards space debris observations. More details on that on Laura's presentation on session seven. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. On behalf of ISA, also thank the ILRS for this opportunity. And also special thanks to Toshi Group for your help during the preliminary validation of some station products. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Any questions in the audience? One from Toshi. Uh, you, you have shown two kinds of uh, calibrations uh, earlier, uh, and you probably said that the second one, uh, the, the uh, fiber one, is preferred. Uh, give, me the, give, me, give us a reason. It's more flexible. Um, I think it's because we can um, perform calibrations without relying on folding optics, and um, we can use the telescope ideally uh, in any position if we wanted to. Uh, I think it's faster in terms of calibration. We run calibrations uh, before every hour and after measurements according to, I guess, some, um, some guidelines that we received and it works pretty, pretty nicely. And we have uh, a two-part question online. Um, so what is the duty cycle between the different activities, uh, space debris, uh, optical communications, and uh, ILRS targets? The question. At the moment, we are mostly uh, focused on um, SLR because it's the, um, the original purpose of the station, let's say, the initial purpose. Um, we dedicated a few weeks to optical communications, but it will... I, I think this is a second priority at the moment. In the future, as new mission will be launched with laser terminals, I would expect more uh, optical communication operations, as well as um, space debris. So I would um, not know at the moment what is the plan for, I mean, in terms of duty cycle. Uh, we are trying to address uh, priorities, and um, I would say at the moment, for the short term, would be equal between the activities. Okay, thank you. And um, just real quick, uh, you mentioned this is Izana 1. Uh, what's the plan for Izana 2? Yes. <laughs> this is an ESOP convention. Even if there is no Izana 2, this would be always <laughs> Izana 1. If in the okay. future uh, um, an ESA laser ranging station will be deployed uh, on Izana, this will be Izana 2. But I guess, um, yes, we have plans to work on another station. At the moment, I cannot uh, share much about that, but uh, I hope in next workshops to be able to provide more information. Thank you very much. We have another question here in the audience. Okay. Hi. Um, so I think the, you said the primary purpose of this station is a as a test bed for industry. Um, so through what routes, as someone from industry, should I go through to um, get access to that test bed? Um, and what kind of things do you imagine um, that could be used for? And what programs do I need to be telling my government to fund in order to get um, access to that station? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have different uh, programs for technology development at ESA, um, including space safety program, also um, Artist Skylight dedicated to communications, and uh, usually on Artist you, uh, you need support from UK, I guess, um, and, um, and usually a proposal is submitted and evaluated. This is what I've seen so far. So via the programs via the ESA programs to reply to your questions in the direction of optical communications, but also SLR. Excellent. Thank you very much.